Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Spiking cases, confusing messaging, and a holiday weekend. Is it a perfect storm for COVID? Why would you have that kind of thing? What did you not understand about our messaging? Stern warnings from health authorities amid a clear failure by some to get the message. As cases soar, new restrictions in Quebec and Alberta. The frightening plot to kidnap Michigan's governor and the violent extremism behind it. Also, using hidden trackers to find out where returns on Amazon really go. A CBC Marketplace investigation. Yeah. We probably minimum get a tractor trailer full a week. This is The National. Thanksgiving is just around the corner, and that tonight is sparking concern as the number of COVID cases climb in Canada. From public health officials in the four hardest hit provinces, Quebec, Ontario, Alberta and B.C., today a singular message. This is not a normal Thanksgiving weekend, so don't act like it is. Be very, very careful. Keep your group small. Now is not the time to be gathering in large groups, traveling long distances for the holiday. If you don't need to go out, don't go out. Celebrate with your close household family members. Don't be part of the problem, be part of the solution. And there is particular concern in Ontario right now. It just smashed another COVID record, adding more new cases today than ever before, raising the possibility that more public health restrictions could be coming. And here's another thing. Thanksgiving weekend is usually a chance for many college and university students to head home, back to family and away from the books. But this year, as Katie Nicholson explains, that could be especially dangerous. These dishes have seen a lot of Thanksgivings. But this year, Judy Toker won't be setting them at this table. She's taking dinner on the road for a socially distanced picnic. Dad and I, and maybe Jonathan, are planning on driving down on Sunday morning. Judy's daughter, Maddie, is at Queen's University, and she's decided it's too risky to come home this weekend. It's just as all the cases started to rise in Ontario, I got a little more nervous. And with a grandmother's health to consider, it just made sense to stay put. I feel it was the right decision, and like many people, I'm trying to take my guidance from all of our public health officials, but also like many people, I'm very confused. With record high cases and the soaring number of contacts, infected people are now reporting anger today from Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health. The fact is that in the first wave, when they did case contact management, they had an average of 10 to 12 people that were contacts of the case. Now they say it's quite common to have 50 to 60 to 70, even up to 100 of a case. That's saying the last five to seven days you were in close contact with. Why would you have that kind of thing? What did you not understand about our messaging? But experts say messaging is a problem. I don't think that the messaging for students has been abundantly clear. What is clear? The risk of travel to anyone. They potentially go home to somewhere where there's not a lot of COVID activity right now. They can introduce COVID into their community and spark outbreaks at home. Ontario's campuses are already bracing for a potential spike after the holiday. But for the homesick, there is a balance between public health and mental health. This is the heaviest time. Midterms are starting next week and it's very stressful. So seeing my family at this time is always really nice, but especially during a pandemic. And while it won't be across the table, it will be across a picnic blanket. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. COVID-19 numbers in Quebec have also reached new heights just before the holiday. We want the population to avoid non-essential non travel between regions. The police will be there to remind you of the instruction. In six of the past seven days, the number of new cases exceeded 1,000. The province has never seen an extended spike like that. And because of it, new rules took effect today in Quebec's expanding red zones. No team sports or organized leisure activities. Gyms are shut down and masks are mandatory for high school students. Now to Alberta, where Edmonton is the biggest source of cases. But unlike in Quebec, today's new restrictions there are only suggestions. Carolyn Dunn shows us how that's going over. Marika Strega has got all the trimmings for a traditional Thanksgiving meal. But this year, it's going to be a strangely small affair. Immediate family only. We're just 
staying in Edmonton and working on our yard and eating lots of food. Edmonton is currently under a COVID watch. Well over half of Alberta's positive cases are in the Edmonton zone and the number is spiking as infection rates grow. We've done some focus groups uh, in the last month or so to look at the opinions of people and those who maybe aren't following restrictions, what would prompt them to do so. And unfortunately for some people, uh, the answer is that they would follow restrictions if they were personally impacted. So today, public health officials introduce new voluntary restrictions, reducing the size of social gatherings from 50 to 15, wearing masks in workplaces where people are closer than two meters, and limiting cohorts to three, family, school, and one cohort for extracurriculars or sports. Now, it's up to Edmontonians to comply. Pretty much anything that she asked, I have full faith and trust in her. Just kind of staying home more, um, not being around as many people. Yeah, especially Thanksgiving is coming up. So it's usually going to be a couple of friends that I know that are very close. But the idea of new restrictions draws the ire of some on social media. You socialists keep pushing, wrote one. Time for riots raged another. Edmonton's mayor says that opposition best and at talk. And so we need everyone to hold each other capable and accountable. Um, the voluntary advice is good. Uh, I think clearly if it doesn't do the trick, then more strict measures uh, I would support. The mayor warns another lockdown will endanger Edmonton's already fragile economy. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. British Columbia has also hit a sobering moment in its pandemic battle. We have 10,000 people who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 in the province. And while we are fortunate that our province and our country has fared better than others, this number does give us reason for pause. This comes as the province recorded 110 new cases today and one more death. Dr. Henry urged people to plan a COVID safe Thanksgiving by staying local, avoiding big groups and dining outdoors if possible. Now let's bring in Dr. Zane Chagla and, and I want to ask you about Thanksgiving because I've heard quite a lot from folks, you know, especially maybe people who live in smaller towns, smaller cities where the case count just isn't that high and they think it's safer to meet in small groups in those places for Thanksgiving than it would be, say, in, you know, like Montreal or Toronto. Is, is that a fair position to take? Yeah, in, in some senses, there there is less transmission in the communities, but it also depends on who's coming to Thanksgiving dinner. If your student is coming home from a, one of those regions, uh, you know, you have the potential of bringing people into the household that are higher risk and interacting them with lower risk. Uh, and so it's, it's important to have those risk assessments done. Um, and, and again, it, just because the, the transmission risks are low, you know, there still is a risk of transmission within, within these small gatherings. And so it's still important to think about the ways we do it safely or, or considering doing it outdoors. Right. Okay. And, and so just on that point, and, and I, I do want to be um, sort of delicate and, and clear that the safest way to celebrate Thanksgiving is, is to stick with members of your own household. But acknowledging yeah. that, that not everybody's going to follow that advice how best to mitigate the harm yeah so i mean as people as we talked about as people go out in their communities afterwards that is going to be a public health disaster if people start taking covid with them so if they go back to areas where there's not much covid circulating it's going to be a problem so those people who are going to you know have these indoor events that are high risk think about what you're doing in the next week think about is if you're getting off a plane and you're going to quarantine for a week uh, and really try to minimize those outdoor contacts because even if there is transmission within that household, at least nothing is happening in your community and making the situation worse. Okay, good advice. And, and as always, good to talk to you, Dr. Chagla. Thanks so much for your time. No problem. In New Brunswick, officials invoked an emergency measure today requiring masks be worn at most indoor public spaces effective midnight tonight. Now, the province's top doctor says she recommended the policy citing the outbreak at a special care home in Moncton where 19 cases have been confirmed. Three new cases were reported in the province today and none was linked to the outbreak. And it does raise concern uh, for us here in Prince Edward Island. We'll all be looking at whether or not we need to uh, make any changes to the Atlantic bubble. 
And PEI's top doctor said the outbreak in their neighboring province has led officials to take a hard look at the Atlantic bubble, which allows residents of all Atlantic provinces to travel freely. Officials are also urging islanders to reconsider travel this Thanksgiving. PEI currently has three active cases of COVID-19. Well, tonight there's an urgent call for action to fend off another surge of suffering and death in Ontario's long-term care homes. Tashana Reed shows us the anger over the long-term care disaster and how the watchdog for patient safety wants to move ahead. Circling Ontario's legislature. <laughs> health workers, advocates, and families who have lost loved ones in long-term care homes. The staffing crisis in long-term care is now worse than it was prior to COVID-19. This protest on the same day as a troubling report from the province's patient ombudsman. Between March and June of this year, the ombudsman received 568 written complaints. Particularly hearing from people who've been left alone for days. Um, it was very hard to hear from family members who were just so distressed that they couldn't see their parent or their spouse. Healthcare workers and staff said they were afraid to go to work. One said staff were told to work even after testing positive. Particularly concerning was a number of um, whistleblower complaints the ombudsman made four recommendations. Every health care provider must have a contingency plan for things like staffing and training, ensure visiting access for caregivers, communicate better, and protect whistleblowers who speak up. Maureen McDermott isn't surprised by the report's findings. They were in their rooms for over a hundred days. That can't happen again. It absolutely can't. I won't watch my mom die of a broken heart through a dirty window again. Her 93-year-old mother, Elsie McDermott, survived COVID-19 after an outbreak at her long-term care facility this past May, but 39 residents died there. Her mother, in isolation again, awaiting test results after a runny nose. There's already PTSD creeping up in me, seeing these reports, other homes in outbreak, and I'm like, here we go again. Right now, 57 long-term care homes have an outbreak in the province. This home behind me is one of them. Today, Ontario's long-term care minister says investments have been made in PPE and staffing and they are better prepared this time. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Turning now to a disturbing plot to kidnap the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer. The plot involved at least six men who objected to her handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. It went as far as running practice drills. Ellen Morrow investigates the scheme and how authorities shut it down. Federal agents spoiling the plot now with the suspects allegedly preparing to buy explosives. I knew this job would be hard, but I'll be honest, I never could have imagined anything like this. Six of the men arrested were charged with planning to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer and hold her hostage before the election. The governor, a Democrat, blamed President Trump, accusing him of stoking anger. The president of the United States stood before the American people and refused to condemn white supremacists. Hate groups heard the president's words not as a rebuke, but as a rallying cry. The suspects allegedly called Whitmer a tyrant. The FBI says they surveilled her vacation home, engaged in tactical and firearm training, even discussed using Molotov cocktails to storm Michigan's Capitol building. This is not a group of you know, a poor, hapless nobodies. This is clearly a group of people that were very focused on accomplishing this violent objective. Far-right groups have been criticizing Whitmer for months, infuriated by Michigan's coronavirus closures. In the spring, armed men took over the state's Capitol building, applauded by President Trump, who tweeted they were very good people. The FBI is spending a huge amount of effort. This analyst says Trump's talk is and has been dangerous. When mainstream politicians exploit those ideas to delegitimize their opponents, that's when a few idiots can become incredibly dangerous movements. And that's exactly what's happening right now. Right-wing extremist groups pose an ever-growing threat, says the FBI, warning of possible violence around the election, an election President Trump has baselessly claimed will be rigged. That, too, is fueling fears of unrest. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington.
Well, last night's tense vice presidential debate has already been mostly overshadowed by the president himself. Today, Donald Trump railed against Kamala Harris, refused to even consider a virtual debate against Joe Biden, and even played the blame game over his COVID-19 diagnosis. Katie Simpson walks us through it. Both Democrats and Republicans had moments to celebrate coming out of the vice presidential debate. Though any talk of it was overshadowed by the president's erratic morning TV interview, where he confirmed he would not participate in the next debate. No, I'm not going to waste my time on a virtual debate. That's not what debating's all about. You sit behind a computer and do a debate. It's ridiculous. Because Donald Trump has COVID, organizers announced next week's matchup would be virtual. Trump's team said no. And after a scheduling fight, it appears there will be one less debate. It's not surprising. I mean, I'll ask a rhetorical question none of you can answer. Were any of you surprised? <laughs> Joe Biden denounced Trump's attacks on his running mate after he also took personal shots at Kamala Harris in that same interview. This monster that was on stage with uh, Mike Pence, who destroyed her last night, by the way. I don't comment on his childish remarks. It's despicable. It's despicable. It's so beneath the office of the presidency. A Marine stood in front of the West Wing for a second day in a row, meaning the president was in the Oval Office despite his infection. He now says he thinks he caught COVID at an event for Gold Star families and attributes his apparent recovery to his overall health. I'm back because I'm a perfect physical specimen and I'm extremely young. 24 hours later, I was feeling great. I went to get out of the hospital. While Trump downplays the severity of his case, his own advisors warn he needs to be careful. The history of COVID-19 is that you could look and feel like you're doing reasonably well, and after a couple of days, you could have a downturn, namely have a reversal. The president's doctor says that Trump continues to respond extremely well to treatments, and as long as that continues to be the case, he can return to public engagements by Saturday. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. And there was another much talked about moment from last night's debate, the conspicuous arrival of, well, let's call it an event crasher. Bias against minorities is, is a great insult. Chances are that fly has been all over your social media feeds today. Now we won't go into the scores of memes it launched, but the Biden-Harris campaign took that fly and flew with it. Within minutes, Flyswatter's branded Truth Over Flies went on sale at JoeBiden.com for 10 bucks a pop, selling out almost instantly. Talk about buzz. Okay, that was terrible. In the southern U.S., millions are preparing as Hurricane Delta strengthens into a Category 3 storm and inches closer to the Gulf Coast. We believe that there will be hurricane-force winds and storm surge in southwest Louisiana in the area of our state that is least prepared to take it. Sandbags are being filled, windows boarded up, and evacuations are underway in a region that was battered by Hurricane Laura less than two months ago. And this storm could still get stronger before making landfall sometime tomorrow. Suncor Energy is laying off 100 contract workers on the Terra Nova vessel in Newfoundland and Labrador. As of November 1st, 30 permanent full-time and part-time contractors will be out of work. The rest of those impacted are casual workers. The company says the layoffs are expected to be temporary. We can now confirm that the clearest contributing factor was human error. Metro Vancouver is taking the blame for a deadly surge of water accidentally released last week from the Cleveland Dam. Two men, father and son, were killed downstream when the spillway gate opened unexpectedly. Officials say the error related to the programming of the control system for that gate. Well, a meeting is being planned between the federal government and Indigenous leaders to address racism against Indigenous people in the health care system. As Olivia Stefanovic explains, it comes in reaction to the treatment of Joyce Escherquan in a Quebec hospital. I heard all the time the voice of Joyce to say, come to, pick, come to take me off at the hospital. All the time, it's like that in my, in my head, in my heart. Alice Eshaquan can't shake the voice of her cousin Joyce, recorded during her final moments in a Quebec hospital last month. The disturbing video captured healthcare workers insulting her and swearing at her. I didn't buy some it's enough the discrimination, it's enough the racism. 
It's a message Joyce's loved ones took to Ottawa. Ms. Miller, I was simply amazing. Minister Miller, I beg you to help me. I beg you, Madame Bennett, to help me. One of Joyce's seven children and a family friend took to their knees, pleading with federal ministers during a meeting on Parliament Hill last week. I don't want to wait one year, her family friend says. I want action. I want action to start tomorrow. I should have gotten down on one knee and begged them for forgiveness for a system that failed them. Today, Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller said he's now calling an urgent meeting with Indigenous leaders to find solutions, noting the inequality faced by Indigenous people has real health consequences. Why the hell would I go get a flu vaccine if I was going to get treated like garbage? Some Indigenous people are afraid of going to hospital because of how they might be treated, this chief says. The system is not at par in terms of, you know, what our people would expect. He says Indigenous communities should take control of their own health care system, which primarily falls under provincial jurisdiction. We need also to have the space to, to uh, provide health ser- care services based on, uh, on our own realities. The federal government is working on carving out that space. It's a complicated task, but there's urgency to see change. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, get this. Up to one-third of all online purchases get returned, but not all of them get resold. We probably minimum get a tractor trailer full a week. Look at Will Williams Landfill. Up next, CBC Marketplace investigates what happens to all that stuff. Plus, hockey players looking for the NHL to commit to diversity breakaway. I think just talking in circles is just a waste of everyone's time. And buying a house in the Atlantic bubble, sight unseen. We're getting them from all over, essentially. (laughs) We're back in two. Welcome back. More of us have turned to online shopping during the pandemic, where Amazon is number one. But that boom in sales also means more purchases are getting returned. And the team at CBC Marketplace wanted to see where they end up. Here's David Common. Go inside this liquidator's warehouse north of Toronto. The shelves are stacked. It's all the Amazon returns. So many Amazon returns, we wanted to know what happens to all of it. All right, let's open these up. So we bought products from Amazon. I got overalls. Pack them with these secret trackers. Tuck the tracker in here. And return them. Some return to Amazon warehouses. Others are resold, but the overalls continue on to this e-waste recycling and product destruction facility. We headed inside undercover to understand why. So h- how much are you dealing with in, in a week, in a month? Yeah, Amazon returns? Yeah. We probably minimum get a tractor trailer full a week. Minimum, but up to three to five. And much of it ends up in a giant shredder. Some of it will go in the landfill. Amazon later tells us the overalls were sent here by mistake. It also says the majority of its return products are resold, okay. donated, or recycled. According to one U.S. firm, landfill is where five billion pounds of American returns end up each year. And online retailers, says this supply chain and waste expert, have a problem. It absolutely disturbs me, and I think a lot of other consumers would be very disappointed as well. But it doesn't surprise him, since Amazon's business agreement with sellers on its site previously made it more expensive to return the item to a seller than to let Amazon decide what to do with it, including disposing of it. But Amazon says it's recently changed that, so sellers can now get a returned item back to them at the same cost. It also believes our reporting is inconsistent with their own findings. And in a statement, Amazon acknowledges that sometimes it cannot resell, recycle or donate returned products. So they say that they're working to reduce the number of instances down to zero. Still though, it is worth considering your own actions when you buy and return online. David Common, CBC News, Brampton, Ontario. And you can see where the rest of the tract returns end up on the season premiere of Marketplace. That is tomorrow night at 8 p.m. on CBC Gem and CBC Television, 8.30 in Newfoundland. Well, and still ahead on The National, why members of the Hockey Diversity Alliance say they're done partnering with the NHL. 
But first, Rosie's here with that issue. Andrew, we're going to talk about some mixed messaging during this second wave of the pandemic, the consequences for political leaders and Canadians. Chantal, Andrew and Althea will join us to talk about that right after this break. Now, folks, we have to tighten it up. It's, it's, it's about as clear, clear as I can be. The rules are very clear. 10 indoors, 25 outdoors. I'd like to make something very clear. that This Thanksgiving, we're asking that you spend the holiday with just your household. That means sitting down to dinner with only the people you live with. All right, some mixed messaging there from the Ontario Premier this week as his province and others continue to face a surge in cases. What are the politics behind the confusion? Who should Canadians be listening to? It's Thursday, and I'm here with that issue. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal, Andrew Coyne is in Toronto, and Althea Raj is here in Ottawa. So uh, the confusion this week, I'll start with you, Althea, has really been uh, specific to Ontario. But at some point, uh, does that require perhaps someone from the federal government to come out and sort of drop the hammer, particularly as we head into Thanksgiving weekend? Uh, I'm going to answer the second question first. Um, I don't think it requires Ottawa to get involved. I mean, these are basically provincial rules, so it's up to the provinces. And frankly, even within the provinces, local jurisdictions for uh, us to listen to our political and also our health experts who tell us what we should be following. Um, you know, I, there's sometimes there's like funny moments <laughs> and you, you need to find humor someplace. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I mean, I think uh, the premier of Ontario, Doug Ford, basically uh, highlighted to us just how confusing the rules are by saying that they were not confusing this week when he himself <laughs> did not understand how many people he could have over at his house for Thanksgiving, saying that he was only going to have 10 people in and that he made sure to tell his wife that he could only invite 10 people over for Thanksgiving dinner. And then he was informed, oh, actually, no. it's no longer 10. Yeah. It's just the immediate people in your actual household. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that highlights for everybody the fact that people are confused, you know, especially Quebec and Ontario. The government is saying, stay home, stay with your immediate circle. But yet businesses are open and yes. life continues as normal. So people are, are you know, having to... to wonder why why are we being told to stay home if life outside of our household continues sure. as normal if, if things yeah. were that serious they would be shutting things down yeah and it's very high numbers in manitoba well manitoba high for manitoba high numbers again in alberta so it's not just in in the, the two biggest provinces Chantal, is there a province that is doing a better job at this during the second wave i'm guessing bc they seem to have flattened that second wave faster than Ontario and Quebec. And they're having a, a provincial election. Yeah. But to your original question, <laughs> should the federal government step in? Really? Uh, it's hard enough for premiers to decide which regions need to do what, uh, and, and rightly so, because there are large areas in Ontario, Quebec, and other provinces that do not have the problems of Toronto, Montreal, or maybe Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. imagine a federal prime minister trying to figure that out and issue orders. Good luck with that. Well, but maybe not even issue orders, Andrew. Maybe just say <laughs> you, you need to start limiting your circle. I mean, I, 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 would that message not be, I realize it's a regional pandemic, but would that message not need to be heard broadly? I think, frankly, would, that would just simply add to the confusion. If, if you're adding in yeah. overlapping jurisdictions, uh, which is perennial a problem in this country, where we're un unsure of which level of government is responsible for what, I'm not sure that would be help. I actually cut some slack for any government at this moment in dealing with this. You're dealing with, unless you, your, your stance is that zero risk is acceptable, uh, in which case you just shut everything down, yeah. and that's certainly simple, but it's also catastrophic and calamitous for the economy. Then if, if you're dealing with what level of risk is acceptable, well, that's going to vary from location to location, from region to region. Mm -hmm. It's going to change mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's inevitable that you're not going to be able to get a, a, a perfect message out there. So as I say, I think in this difficult balancing act that people in public uh, office have yeah. to do, 
where they're getting advice on the one hand from, from health authorities, but they're also having to think about the economic consequences and the different kinds of health risks that are associated with this, not just the risk from the pandemic, but the risk from uh, a really severe economic shock uh, in terms of lost jobs and suicides and everything else. Sure then I, I, I have some uh, time for people who are trying to, to wrestle with this and trying to get, to, to get a message out. I'm much more concerned about the substantive failings on things like testing, yeah. where it's pretty, quite shocking that we're still at such low levels of testing, than on the messaging question. Okay, I, I wanted to do that topic because everyone is heading into the weekend thinking about it. But I also want to turn to some comments from the Prime Minister today. We're also all, of course, watching the political story south of the border. And the Prime Minister was asked about the U.S. election a couple times today. Here's what he said. I think uh, we're certainly all uh, hoping uh, for a smooth transition or a, a clear result from uh, the election, like many people are around the world. Uh, if it is less clear, there may be some disruptions, and we need to be ready for any outcomes. And I think that's uh, what Canadians would expect of their governments, and uh, we're certainly reflecting on that. So what does that tell us, uh, if anything, Althea, about the reflections happening inside his office, about you know the, th the things that we're all thinking about in regards to this election? Well, I think the Prime Minister's office, just like uh, many Americans and uh, people in capitals across the world, frankly, are concerned that on election night, it will appear like Donald Trump has won a sweeping uh, majority of a mandate. Uh, and then weeks later, we will discover potentially that actually uh, Vice President Biden has won the election. And I think that, you know, for the first time, and we saw this through access to information request in 2015 and uh, 2016, the government was completely ill-prepared, had actually not even seemed to consider the possibility that Donald Trump might win the election, had no plans at all. Foreign Affairs was rushing to find out what the president had or the president elect had actually said on the campaign trail because they were ill-equipped. This is not the case this time. Uh, they are prepared for a variety of scenarios, and I think that that is that's good for us. It is interesting. I mean, it is the first time that he has gone so far as yeah. to declare an opinion or talk about contingency plans that the government uh, has with regards to the U.S. election. Well, or to recognize that we may not have an answer uh, on election night, uh, Chantal. Or to recognize that we would really, really like to have a clear answer on mm -hmm. election night. Yeah. Because uh, I, I think if you put it in order, uh, a decisive result would be the first thing. And I don't think that's just the liberals. I think it no. cuts across the political Everybody. class. <laughs> yeah. A decisive result, preferably a decisive Biden victory, uh, which is not something that you're going to hear anyone saying out loud. But if you look at any uh, polls in any country, Europe, it's overwhelming, uh, and so is Canada. But uh, to have the worst is a result that is not clear. And at this point, it is a possibility. I'm not sure you can really prepare for that, except to tell people not to say anything and, uh, unless it becomes clear that uh, whoever is winning is winning. Yeah. But uh, it, it is the last worst scenario for anyone anywhere outside the U.S. I, I realize the circumstances are vastly different, but I mean, we have experienced it before with, with Bush and Gore, uh, Andrew, and, and everyone sort of had to cool their jets for a while in terms of uh, saying anything. This is many multiples worse than that, potentially. Uh, when you look at the scenarios, when you look at the president's refusal to publicly state that he would accept uh, uh, anything but uh, his own victory, uh, that he would accept a peaceful transition of power on a day when, what is it, 13 people have been arrested in a, in a plot, allegedly, to kidnap the governor of Michigan. Uh, when you look at some of the scenarios where uh, Trump is encouraging people, his supporters, to think that the election was stolen from them, many of those supporters are armed. Uh, we should not kid ourselves about the potential for really uh, uh, hideous outcomes beyond just weeks and months of paralysis in the United mm -hmm. States, but mm -hmm. the civil disorder. So, as Chantel said, what exactly you can plan for, for in Canada to, to deal with that, I don't know, except to say one thing, which is I would imagine there'd be heavy pressure on other countries from Trump uh, to recognize his quote-unquote victory. Uh, and I hope that the countries uh, of the sort of civilized world, if I can put it that way, are consulting with each other and will uh, greet that with a unanimous or, or a collective no. Mm -hmm. uh, but there'll be a lot of pressure put on, I would think. Okay, let, let's talk about this again as we get closer to the American election. Thank you all for this week. Appreciate it. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast for extra content, including the panel's take on this story. 
We have done something that has never been done before in Canadian politics. Look for it on any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. For now, though, it's back to Adrian and Andrew in Toronto. Thanks, Rosie. Still ahead on the national, the real estate boom inside the Atlantic bubble. So bear with me one minute. I'll get this turned around so you can see. Lured by promises of a pandemic paradise, people are buying property sight unseen. But first, hockey players fight the NHL on diversity right after this. Looking roughly 50 solutions over the next 10 years that can really turn the tide and really change the way we deal and tackle with environmental challenges. Well, the Duke of Cambridge announced what is being called the Nobel Prize for Environmentalism. The Earthshot Prize will award five £1 million prizes each year for the next decade for projects aimed at tackling the world's climate problems. Nominations open next month. In the sports world, the Hockey Diversity Alliance has said it will stop working with the NHL after months of negotiations. The initiative, led by black NHL players, said it didn't get enough support from the league. Jamie Strachan has the details. From Sudbury Wolves to the entire Hockey League, Quinton Byfield. This should have been a great week for the NHL. Quinton Byfield was drafted higher than any black player ever. But the diversity celebration didn't last long. We believe the time for listening and learning has um, come, come and gone. We is the Hockey Diversity Alliance, a group of current and retired black NHL players formed after the death of George Floyd. Its goal, make a traditionally white sport more diverse, from the grassroots through to the NHL. It asked the league to be a partner and commit to a pledge that included hard targets around minority hiring and employment. We just feel like not enough um, was getting done and essentially the league came back saying that they weren't ready to commit to any, any numbers. Aliyu says the league prioritized PR efforts over actual change. Until we can get some hard numbers, I think just talking in circles is just a waste of everyone's time. Racism has been embedded in our society for far too long. The NHL has struggled to find its footing on issues of race and discrimination. <laughs> on a night when most sports leagues pause to protest the police shooting of Jacob Blake, the NHL played on. As minorities in the NHL, we've been undervalued and we've been overlooked. For some, the HDA's decision was reflective of the NHL's lack of meaningful engagement. You've got the NHL, predominantly white decision makers, leaving all the work, all the toil up to racialized BIPOC community. It's unacceptable. Ahmed wonders why NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman hasn't taken a more central role on this issue. I don't know if it's an unwillingness, but I think they're completely unprepared for these conversations. The NHL hasn't commented publicly on the HDA decision. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, and when we come back, the pandemic and your money. As we all stay home more, maybe you can relate to this. Our driving has reduced uh, by more than half. So why are car insurance rates spiking right after this? When businesses started having people work from home, that led to less car traffic. And then you had insurance companies giving out rebates. But as it turned out, only to some drivers. Jacqueline Hansen tells us other drivers got an unwelcome surprise. Kara and John Decker are working from home as much as possible during the pandemic, which means they aren't driving their usual commute. 130 kilometers each every day. Our driving has reduced uh, by more than half. When they renewed their car insurance in May, they expected their rate to go down. Instead, it jumped from $245 a month to $293, nearly $600 extra a year. It's significant given that there was no change in our situation, no accidents, no claims. $48 a month means more to us than it does, uh, than it does to them. 
In the spring, car insurers made headlines when many said they'd give drivers a break due to the pandemic. And again, when some customers complained, those promises fell short. But the Insurance Bureau of Canada tells us insurers did follow through with rebates across the board rate reductions and lower premiums because of changes in coverage and returned about $750 million to drivers. But according to the rate comparison website, lowestrates.ca, new quotes didn't get the same treatment. In Ontario, rates have slightly risen. If you look in other provinces in Canada, specifically Alberta and the Atlantic provinces, prices have increased significantly versus last year. During the period of April to June, the firm says the average quote across provinces where insurance isn't provincially regulated continued to tick higher. Even though streets were quiet, lowest rate says other factors that predated the pandemic continue to drive up prices, from technology that makes cars more expensive to repair to regulatory changes and increased insurance fraud. They were having to pay out too much in claims versus the premiums that they were receiving from drivers. For the Deckers, even if they are back to commuting full time by their next contract renewal, we'll definitely be shopping around. Not just for a better deal, but they say for the principle of it. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. While there has been an increase in coronavirus cases in New Brunswick in recent days, overall the so-called Atlantic bubble is holding strong with a lower rate of COVID-19. And as Kayla Hounsel shows us, that has made it a very desirable destination for those looking to relocate. Oh wait, it's not even... Amy Reitzma and Aniron Pasco are still settling in. As they watched COVID cases in the UK rise, they traded London for the tiny coastal community of Seabright, Nova Scotia. And we just thought we, we don't need to fight this fight anymore. Like this is, we love London, but we got to a point where we were thinking that there's got to be a better way. Ian Yule just moved back from California and says he's not the only one. I could overhear the conversations of the people in front of me as they were talking to the custom agents, and it was a similar story four or five times in a row. Reason for coming to Canada, moving home. The Canada Border Services Agency doesn't track the number of people crossing the border to move home because Canadians just have an inherent right to do so. But there is evidence more Canadians are relocating, and in some cases moving to the Atlantic region from other parts of the country. We're getting them from all over, essentially. <laughs> This realtor says people are drawn to the relative security of the Atlantic bubble. But because anyone coming in is required to isolate for two weeks, that's dramatically changing her work. So bear with me one minute, I'll get this turned around so you can see. She's showing homes virtually. This one's a little bit smaller. Some have no connection to the region at all. Some of them have young families, they're concerned about their safety and well-being. And also another thing is because a lot of people are working remotely now, it's given them a lot of flexibility to move. Reitzma and Pasco are expecting their first child, and that made a difficult decision more clear. I know it's the right decision. You know, it's, it, I can feel it so strongly that what the Maritimes have been able to do is really unique, and it's very, very worth protecting. They also know their pandemic move will be a great story to tell their baby someday. Good job. Nice. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Seabright, Nova Scotia. Well, next on The National, a hockey practice to remember. He was on the ice when he found out he got drafted right after this. You are watching the moment this young hockey player's dreams came true. 18-year-old Jake Boltman found out he was being drafted to the Calgary Flames during hockey practice yesterday. The Lincoln Stars coach uh, found out before he did, obviously, put the news up on the board to alert him and his reaction is our moment. I woke up really, really nervous, didn't really sleep the night before that well. I'm thinking about it basically the whole day and uh, it kind of kind of stays in your back of your head, especially during practice too, knowing uh, knowing it's going on. But um, when I found out uh, at that big board, and then having all my teammates tap me like that, it was it was pretty special to share that moment with them. So yeah, I call my my uh, my mom and dad, my brother right away, just to kind of share that moment with them. I mean, I wish I was 
they were kind of here so I could give them a hug and thank them for everything that they've done for me. But um, uh, we also had practice to finish up too. So that was, uh, that's something I'll, I'll never forget for sure. Um, I mean, uh, I don't think there's any, any cooler way to find out that you've been drafted than, and then to be on the ice with all your teammates and, and friends. Hmm. Yeah, it is amazing. It is. I've watched that so many times today, and I do get that kind of little freeze on of like, oh, it must have <laughs> right. been great. He, uh, very diplomatic. He says he's looking forward to seeing more of Canada. He's only been to Winnipeg. He really wants to see the Calgary. He knows those fans are rowdy. And, and yet, I mean, you still got to resist the temptation to get too excited, right? I mean, getting drafted is, is just one step in potentially playing in the NHL, but... I mean, his coach has got a lot of faith in him. Apparently, he knows how to keep it simple, keep his eyes on the puck. He'll do it. That's the National for this Thursday, October 8th. Have a good night. Good night.